to what Katrina says about the reality of what's happening day to day in Venezuela, and then one goes and buys the newspaper and sees what they write there, you'd have to think the journalists flew into the wrong country yeah. and have been reporting from somewhere else. Who knows where? It would be interesting to know where this country that they're reporting from is. But it certainly bears no resemblance of what is going on in Venezuela today. In fact, I can't think of a case because the reality is that the corporate media always has a very restricted debate. Now, that's always been the thing. In Australia, you know, one newspaper may be a little bit more pro-Labor, one be pro-Liberal or whatever, but anything outside of that is just deemed as, you know, irrelevant, just not, not newsworthy. Uh, but in Venezuela, the consensus is so tight where it doesn't matter if you turn on Fox News or, you know, the Guardian newspaper that a lot of sort of uh, left liberals like to read. It's, it's, you pretty much will find the same article that has the same general story about what is happening in Venezuela. And every day, they just repeat the same story. They'll find whatever the latest news is and then use that to repeat the same story. What is that story? Very simply, Venezuela's a mess. Humanitarian crisis, and it's all the result of Maduro and socialism. No need to explain it. That's just stated as a fact from the media. Secondly, that because of this situation, people angered by the economic uh, shortages have now come out to peacefully protest against the government. No other avenue has been left for them except to peacefully take to the streets. And face of this, the Maduro government has taken the road of authoritarian, totalitarianism of repression. All of these three points are just simply stated as fact, without any evidence to back them up whatsoever. But yet it's so easy, if anyone wanted to spend the time, to start to see how the reality does not reflect this very simple story that the media portrays. I could give list heaps of statistics, but I just want to pick a couple to look at each of those three points that the, the media talks about. So the question of repression and the death toll in Venezuela. And this, this is one of the most, uh, perhaps, it, it is really an illuminating example of how if you repeat a lie enough times, people will start to believe it. So the media has constantly come up with the refrain that it will always say, every article will say the same thing. In a context of peaceful protests, that have been repressed, we now have X, whatever the latest death toll is. Anyone who reads that automatically interprets, well, obviously the majority of them have to be the peaceful protest. I mean, any peaceful protest I've ever been to, I, no one's ever killed a police officer there and been peaceful. So the logical conclusion is 80, 90 people, I think the last death toll that I've seen, and these death tolls will vary, and I'll explain why, but the last one I've seen is sort of now in, in the low, low 90, so 93, I think, was, was, was the figure I, I, I've seen. Now, if we put aside the fact that in this context of, you know, where, what, you know, as Katrina mentioned, and, and the government itself has said, you know, there's, no one can deny that there has not been uh, certain examples where someone could point to uh, acts of abuse by security forces, but in a context of basically armed war against them. Um, the actual reality, when we start to break down the figures of who is actually being killed, shows a remarkably different story to what the media said, but one that the opposition re refused to accept. And the, the brazenness of how much they refused to accept this, to me, was illustrated when one of the latest protests they did, probably about a week and a half ago, again, mainly aimed at international media, was in one of the main highways that crosses the east of Caracas. They wrote a list of all of the deaths that had occurred up until now. Uh, I think at that point it was in the mid-60s. And, you know, this top was uh, victims of Maduro's regime, SOS Venezuela. And of course this was just played by the media as, oh, you know, another, look at these peaceful protests, just list, look how many have been killed. The most galling thing was that in this list, we could go through all of them and I could give you stories about how many of them shouldn't have been on this list, but they included a man by the name of Orlando Figuera. Now, if people who don't know that person, he was the one that made the occasionally made the news because he was a young black man who happened to be walking past an opposition protest who someone accused of either being a chavista or a thief, whoever you want to believe, uh, and essentially a group of 100 opposition protesters turned on him, stabbed him, set him alight, uh, it burned his body, 90% of his body was covered in burn, and died a week or so later in hospital. This, the opposition person had no problems adding this person to their list of victims of the Maduro regime. Um, but this is just one name. Then when we go to the actual figures, what do the actual figures show? Well, Venezuela analysis has a very detailed breakdown of the death toll with evidence pointing to which ones are in dispute, which ones are clearly not in dispute, who's been responsible for what deaths. According to their toll, 
They say the last figure was 13 of these 93 have been a direct result of security forces that have been killed. And that's in a context where 29 security forces have been arrested for, for these. Compare that to the US where every day we hear another young black man being killed and no police officer even being charged, let alone uh, put in jail. The public prosecutor, uh, Louisa Ortega, who, was re who Katrina referred to, has pretty much now taken an open position of supporting the opposition uh, in Venezuela. Her department says the figure is more like 23. So she's taken a lot of controversial, disputed evidence, uh, incidents and said, no, no, they're definitely the result of the security forces. But even if we take that figure, which is by far the highest one that anyone has put forward as you know, somehow based on fact, only 25% of the deaths that have occurred until now have actually been a result of state security forces. So where are the rest of these deaths coming from? Well, by far the biggest factor has been the roadblocks that Katrina referred to, where people have either died directly as a result of being killed at those roadblocks because they tried to go past, walk by, and the, the protesters did not want to let them by. Either as a result of traffic accidents that have been caused um, at, at these roadblocks, or either as a result of indirectly, for instance, not being able to get to a hospital just simply because the roadblocks would not let these, these people go through. We also have about 13 who have died as a result of in being involved in some kind of act of sabotage or looting. In one incident, eight people alone were electrocuted inside a, a, a shop that they were looting. Um, someone obviously triggered off a, a wire and the people inside you know, died as, as a result of that. All of this is just ignored in the media. 93 deaths, peaceful protests, repressive government, you draw the conclusion of where these deaths are, are from. A second thing, Maduro socialism is to blame for all the shortages. Now there's no doubt and there's no denying that there are very extreme serious shortages in Venezuela. But why don't we try and investigate a little bit more the figures and try to understand why is this the case today and really understand what is behind some of these shortages. And I want to provide, again, I don't want to go into too many figures, but I just want to provide just some simple ones, simple context that the media always rules out. The media simply explains it as this. Once oil-rich Venezuela, today is a basket case because no one can get medicine. That's their story. Of course, in their story of oil-rich Venezuela, what they mean is that back in the 80s or in the 70s, you could go to a pharmacy and there was medicines on the shelf. So that for them is a good functioning capitalist system because if you want to, you can buy that. Of course, back in the 70s, 80s and 90s in Venezuela, we had a situation where 80% of the people lived in absolute poverty. We had a situation where where the access to healthcare was limited to 30% of the population and it doesn't take a genius to guess where that 30% were. Largely in the bigger cities, largely in the middle upper class areas. If you lived in a poor neighbourhood in Caracas, if you lived in the countryside in a state like Apure, a doctor medicine didn't mean anything to you because you didn't have access to those doctors. You would have to travel days if you wanted to even get, even get to that. Now that starts to change in 2003 because Chavez the Chavez government, in an attempt to overcome this situation, initiates social programs, like, for instance, Mission Barrio Dentro, where we have a, a, this, uh, um, a sort of a, a mobilization, really, is what you could call it, of thousands, then 10,000, then 20,000, initially largely Cuban doctors, uh, but then now also Venezuelan doctors who are graduating through the medical programs, who ensure that today, 67% of the population is covered solely by the public sector. Now, if you consider that before Chavez came to power, the roughly 30% was largely private, it means almost everyone today in Venezuela now can actually have access to a doctor. And it's no surprise that when you have access to a doctor and you have less poverty, you have an increased consumption in medicine. <coughs> so let's look at the figures of medicine importation and the money that's been given to do this. In 2003, the government implemented currency controls to stop essentially capital flight from being able to leave the country. Because it controls most of the dollars coming in by the oil company, Tadavesa, uh, it is able to decide what those dollars are used for. And so it is very easy to keep an accurate record of where this money is being used in terms of importation. In 2003, the government handed over $400 million to pharmaceutical companies, largely transnational corporations like Pfizer, for them to import 21 million kilograms of medicine. 400 million, 21 kilograms in 2003. Barrio Adentro starts. Within five years, the government is giving them $1.6 billion, so four times more money, so that they can now bring in 
uh, 60 million kilograms of medicine, three times more. So there's already started to be a discrepancy, but you can also see why it is that now that people have access to healthcare, that actual medical consumption goes up. 2008, 1.6 billion, 600 million kilograms of medicine. This is where it gets interesting though. 2014, 2.4 billion dollars given to these corporations. That is almost double, from 1.6 billion in 2008 to 2.4 billion in 2014. How much medicine do they bring into the country? 31 million kilos, half of what they were bringing in in 2008. As a result of the tightening of spending by the government because of the dropping oil prices, a bit less money is given to them in 2015. They get 1.8 billion. So that's still more than in 2008, but yet once again, the amount of medicine into the country declines. 25 million kilograms of medicine come into the country. So you have this situation where essentially the cost of an average kilogram of medicine in Venezuela has gone from $22 roughly a kilo in 2003 <coughs> to 77 dollars a kilo. And this has got nothing to do with the inflation in Venezuela because this is what we're talking about is medicine being imported. So unless we're talking about a 250% inflation rate in the rest of the world for the price of medicine, and everyone here I'm sure has deals with having to buy medicine, I, I certainly haven't encountered that inflation uh, in medicine prices. Something is obviously going seriously wrong with these transnational corporations that continue to get this money and yet somehow are unable to bring the medications that they're promising to bring in with these dollars uh, into the country. And the figure becomes even more curious and you start to see just how much money these corporations are ripping off the ordinary Venezuelans when you add them to two other figures. Firstly is that all of the medical companies today in Venezuela continue to register profits on their books. None of them have been expropriated by the government. None of them have said, oh, we've gone bankrupt for one reason or other. They all continue somehow to make profit in the context of these dramatic shortages. And they were talking about 70%, basically. That's the, the figure that's rough put together today. 70% of medicines, or at least most urgent medicines, cannot be found in Venezuela. Yet they continue to make a profit. And secondly, IMS Health, which is basically dedicated, it's a basically a private company dedicated to promoting pharmaceutical industry to private companies, telling them where are the best markets to invest. We're telling these companies that in 2014, again, when this disparity, this huge disparity begins to emerge between the amount of money that is being given to them and the little amount of medication that's coming in, that the Venezuelan market for medicines was the second biggest in all of Latin America. That includes Mexico, whose population is probably about five times the size of Venezuela. Uh, it includes uh, bigger than, the only country basically was Brazil, and on a per capita basis, of course, Venezuela was the most, the country that most spent money on, on medicine. So you think, how is this happening? This, the, more people are buying, more dollars are being given, and yet there are more shortages. So obviously there are a number of key factors that are happening here. Firstly is the rise in consumption in medication. This doesn't get referred to in the media, because the media don't care if people have actual access to medicine. They only care as long as it's on the shelf and people can buy it. If they can't buy it because they're poor, then it doesn't really factor in, into their corporate agenda. But it also doesn't take into consideration the clear cases of corruption and misuse of funds that are occurring uh, by these transnational governments. And I think it must be said, obviously, with the complicity of some people uh, within, within the state, because the, obviously some people are giving them the money and noticing these things and not, not acting on them to, to basically put this, put this corruption um, to a stop. The third bit, what about the nature of the opposition? Is it just people coming up for, for economic issues? Well, I think really Katrina covered it really well. I mean, what we're seeing today is gone far beyond people just protesting over political issues to essentially armed gangs, you know, carrying out reigns of terror in local communities. They have no political demands whatsoever, uh, except to terrorise people and hope that they, on, on that basis, turn, turn against the government. But these people have always had a clear agenda. These are the same people who in 2002 attempted a military coup against Chavez. The end of 2002, 2003 carried out a lockout of the oil industry to try to destroy the economy through that. That when Maduro won the elections in 2013 carried out violent street protests that left about a dozen dead. That in 2014 carried out the same street protests, the ones that Katrina referred to, that if the memory serves me right, was almost 50 dead uh, left to resolve this. So this is nothing new, but the media just ignores this. The media just presents this all as just simply just ordinary people out in the streets, nothing to do with a sustained campaign to get rid of the, the Chavez government and to get rid of the important gains that have been made as a result of the Chavez government. So where I think where does this leave us? I'm gonna, I, I want to 
skip a bit on, sorry, I'm contracting mine because I, I think people will probably want to ask more questions really than just, just hear me talk. And we want to make the use of Katrina, we want to make the use of our, our friend from Venezuela, uh, Marco, uh, who's here. I want to make the use of, of Danielle as well to, to be able to answer the, the questions that, that people have. But I just want, I want to, I suppose, you know, sum, summarise this or bring it, bring it down to a why. I mean, because it's not the first time really that the government, uh, sorry, the media has you know, run such a sustained campaign. We've seen this against other countries, other governments. But I'm not sure it's taken to the level that we've seen today against Venezuela. I think it's really to a whole new level. And I think it's, that it gives us an indication of how much is at stake in Venezuela today. The explanation lies in the fact that Venezuela today represents a sign, the site of a profound revolutionary process of change that has been occurring in that country. Essentially, depending on you know, who you want to sort of uh, who you agree more with since basically 89 with the Caracazo uprising and the rebellion from below that essentially led to the election of Hugo Chavez in 98 or whether you want to date it from when, when Chavez first, first gets elected. But this profound process of change is both spearheaded, a broader process of change in the region, and within that context pointed towards an anti-capitalist direction, a way out of the capitalist crisis for the region. And this is too much for the pro-corporate media for the pro-capitalist governments around the world to really be able to tolerate. So today we have a situation where regionally we've suffered a number of setbacks. Most probably importantly is the coup in Brazil that the media seem to have missed and no longer really refer to at all as a coup government, an illegitimate government, uh, one where a parliament <coughs> overturned the vote of the people in order to install their own uh, mini dictator who is enshrined in the constitution now that for the next 20 years social spending cannot increase uh, in Brazil, no matter who gets into government uh, at the next elections, um, that is trying to bring in uh, pension reforms. That will mean that people will have to have worked a minimum of 47 years before they can actually access any pension. Uh, so you consider that. If you've gone to university and haven't started working until about the age of 23 or so, you'll be working until you're 70 before you can access pension in a country whose life expectancy is well below uh, 70 uh, in, in, in Brazil. Um, none of this matters in the media because the, the mini dictators on the side of the media it's about promoting their same corporate agenda. Of course in Venezuela the very serious problems at home makes it very difficult as well for the revolutionary process to, to be able to continue to advance. It's dealing with what's happening in the region, what's happening in the, in the country, in the economic sphere. But I think perhaps most importantly, Katrina referred to this, the, 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 the impact it's having on the morale of people. You know, how long can you continue to hold on when you cannot basically access those very essential needs uh, that you need to do for day to day? Um, it takes a very strong people to have survived as long as what's been happening in Venezuela so far. Um, the question is, you know, how long can that continue, that situation remain uh, the same? The right understand that pro-capitalists understand that a victory in Venezuela will not just be a setback for the left in the region, but will really be, you know, it will set back everything that has occurred in the continent for the last 15 to 20 years. And that doesn't mean struggles will disappear or you know, the left will disappear, but we'll, we'll essentially be starting a new chapter in those struggles. All of those gains that have been made will have been, will have been sort of had the final death blow dealt um, if they're able to carry out their, their sort of coup campaign uh, in Venezuela. They'll of course trumpet this as proof that there is no alternative to capitalism. If anyone dares to make even the mildest reforms to the system, you end up like a basket case like Venezuela. That's what, that's what they'll say. And we know exactly how the right wing will try to resolve the economic crisis in Venezuela if they do get to power. Firstly, it'll be by real violence and repression. Uh, the one you won't hear about in the media, uh, but that will make what's going on in Venezuela today seem like child's play. Um, we've got many historical examples of what has happened when a right wing uh, government has emerged out of a, a coup situation. Uh, Chile 1973 being, of course, the most, the most famous of that, but there are many others. But we also know how they will try to resolve the economic situation because the right wing worrying government the last time Venezuela faced an important economic crisis, when the oil prices were seriously uh, hit at the end of the 70s. And what did we see the government do at that time? These are the last figures I'll give, I promise. From 1975, fiscal income, so the amount of money in the budget per person in Venezuela was the equivalent of 1,500 US dollars, or 1,500 dollars per person. By 1999, they had resolved their economic crisis by basically cutting fiscal income per person to only 350 dollars per person. So 
Uh, 15 years, give or take uh, 15 years, no, sorry, uh, 25 years, $1,500 to $350 per person was what they were putting forward in the budget. Real wages of an ordinary working person in Venezuela went from $5,200 a month in 1978 to two two thousand. Sorry, I've got I've, I'll, two thousand and one hundred dollars in ninety-nine. So less than half in that same period of time of what ordinary people were taking home uh, in their wages. This is what they have waiting for the Venezuelan people if they're able to get back into power. Uh, reign of terror, like they're trying to do already at now at the local level, combined with serious economic measures that will uh, break the back of ordinary people in Venezuela. I think that's why it's incumbent on us to increase our solidarity. We're in one of those periods, I think, now where everything we do counts. A lot of times we feel like, you know, we do so many things and nothing changes and perhaps it's not really worth it. But I think everything we do today can make that little bit of a difference in helping the Venezuelan struggle. Even if it's things like putting out statements from our organisations, sending letters uh, to our parliamentarians or to in trade unions or whatever it is to ask them to adopt positions in support of Venezuela. Even writing to the media, when they do put these lies across in the media, just send a letter saying, well, hang on, actually what you're saying there is not true. You should be able to factually check that stuff. Uh, and where it's done, particularly if it's done in a sustained camp way, the media do have to reverse it. Okay, sometimes the damage has been done because the people have already read that article and by the time it gets changed. But those little things hopefully mean that people start to question what is occurring. And it means the media knows that we're watching them. I think forums like this, the street presence where possible protest actions, um, going to Venezuela, um, Katrina's with Venezuela Analysis, they're organising a delegation for August um, um, for people to go there, encourage people if they can to get there and see for themselves what's, coming, what's going on and come back and, and bring that information. My last sentence to, to round it off, this month is going to be absolutely intense without a doubt in Venezuela. I think what Katrina referred to today is just a harbinger, is really just the beginning of what we'll see occur over this month because at the end of July, Venezuelans go to vote for a constituent assembly and the opposition have made it clear they do not want this constituent assembly elections to go ahead. And what they're doing today is just a small scale of what they plan to do over the next month, which is a combination of violence, reign of terror in communities, attacks on key supply, and we're starting to see that now. Actually, the latest addition to the death toll was a young man who died trying to sabotage an electric substation, and as a result, electrocuted himself. Of course, that would just be another death toll. Of course, the media will step up their efforts in all of this, um, and there will be a real test of what the security forces do as well. They'll be testing to see, can they find support within the security forces? Can they force, provoke a response from them that can then be easily portrayed to a willing media as you know the final repression of of the dictatorial regime. All of this to stop the constituent assembly going, going at the end of this month. And I think we have to consider that and think about how we can be equal to that challenge here in Australia. I'll finish there, thank you. Mm -hmm. thank you.